Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the inaugural Rutgers IT lecture series. Uh, we have a great program lined up for you today. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Frank Rita. I'm an associate vice president with the Office of Information Technology, and I'll be guiding us through the program today. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to take a moment and provide some background on the lecture series and offer some words of appreciation for those who helped make this event possible as well. Um, as you may be aware, we were planning on having a Rutgers IT day later this fall, but like most things these days, COVID-19 caused us to change course. Uh, there was a steering committee for that Rutgers IT day event and when we decided to cancel the event out of the uncertainty of, of surrounding COVID-19, uh, this creative and dedicated group of people that were working on the Rutgers IT Day did some brainstorming and came up with what we're here to kick off today. The Rutgers IT Day was intended to highlight the best and brightest ideas in IT at Rutgers University. And our intent for the IT lecture series is to do the same but on a more frequent basis. So, as I indicated, there have been a lot of people that have worked on this and have made this day possible and just wanted to send my personal thanks to everyone who's worked on this event thus far. So, with that, we're gonna dive right in because we've got quite a bit of content for today. So, uh, at this point, I'd like to introduce the Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer at Rutgers University, Michelle Norton. And Michelle has been at Rutgers for nearly five years now and has responsibility for providing overarching leadership of IT for the institution. In working with the President and other senior executives, Michelle has led Rutgers with tremendous progress being made in advancing our technological capabilities. And prior to arriving at Rutgers, Michelle spent most of her career at the University of Arizona. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to hand off to Michelle so that she can say a few words to get us started here today. Michelle? Thanks, Frank, and good morning, everyone. I am thrilled to uh, have this opportunity and, and the fact that we're even here today to, to launch to launch this this event. Uh, I wanted to start by sharing some observations and thoughts about the circumstances that we find ourselves in. I mean, here we all are, uh, you know, I, I everyone is joining from from wherever you consider remote to be who, who would have ever thought a year ago that uh, that that we, we would be in this mode. I mean, it's just kind of, it's mind boggling to think about, but here we are. And I, I really want to start by expressing my sincere appreciation to all of you as I IT professionals at, at Rutgers. You know, we're, we're in this mode. The institution has, like many other uh, institutions, um, has was able to pivot very quickly uh, with, within a very short amount of time into the mode that we're in today. And I dare say that, and, I, and I, I've said this many times, one of the most critical uh, factors in our ability to be successful in the mode that we are in is, is, is IT. We, we cannot be remote without having a, a strong technological environment and, and set of capabilities. And so that, and that, that's attributed to all of you. I, you know, if, if we think about how we got to today, uh, we, we found ourselves positioned very well. We've been working on this for a number of years now, all of us, in terms of expanding and building on our capabilities for 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 technology we, we've had a, a set of strategic priorities that we, we've been focused on over the last several years and every facet of of our institution research academics um, our, our our business operations uh, data 
uh, reliable networks, uh, you know, reshaping healthcare, um, always looking for ways to simplify IT, uh, and of course the IT profession itself. So we've been focused on this for a while. Um, and we've been making extremely um, good progress in, in furthering um, our capabilities. And I'll, I'll just, I wanna talk about some of those. Uh, we use them every day. We're using one today with WebEx and our collaboration tools, but these tools have become critical to our ability to be remote. We, we have Box and OneDrive for uh, remote file storage. Uh, we, you know, our efforts to consolidate email and calendaring were instrumental, became instrumental uh, with, with Office 365. Microsoft Teams, we're gonna hear about that today uh, from Vlad. WebEx, soon to be Zoom, LinkedIn Learning, We've been expanding the My Rutgers portal with more self-service capabilities. Uh, we've been coordinating and consolidating uh, efforts around the support desk and, and how that operates. Um, all of the work being done at the local levels, uh, those are critical components to how we're operating today. Um, and uh, so, so the fact that we were positioned so well is, is to, to credit all of you. Um, in each of these opportunities, the fact that we've landed these solutions in the cloud um, has allowed us to, to pivot so quickly as well. We've got other things in progress or in process today, things like Salesforce and ServiceNow. We're working on our, our, our enterprise business applications um, with HR and CRM and student um, as that, that progresses. <clears throat> We're looking at other tools like virtual desktops and virtual labs those kinds of solutions that'll that'll help uh, move us forward as well as we continue to be remote. Canvas, we're consolidating our learning management systems, that's underway. Uh, we were able to quickly uh, leverage telehealth tools in the field, on the fly. Um, those were uh, successful, they'll continue to be successful, um, and we continue to expand our, our service management framework. So all of these efforts, what we've done in the past, what we're doing today, what we're gonna focus on next um, is, you know, is evidence of um, the fact that we've been focused here and we continue to focus here and, and the efforts by all of you to, to provide this level of support. It's not easy being in this mode. I, I think we all recognize that uh, you know, those of us who have different dynamics at home uh, some more complicated than others. You know, th those are factors that everyone who's in remote mode, us uh, and, and others, um, have been learning to, to navigate. And so I, I credit all of you for uh, figuring that out on the fly and still being committed to the work that, that you do in, in supporting the institution. It has been recognized by institutional leadership. President Bartu, extremely pleased with how we we're able to transition so smoothly, uh, and 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 he has expressed that very publicly in terms of the appreciation for that. And so again, I just I want to start on that note, uh, as as Frank indicated, that has of course influenced um, uh, what we're doing today and and the efforts of of the group. I want to highlight another point, point about today. So we're launching a, a lecture series, which I'm excited about. I, wanna, I want to uh, directly express appreciation to the folks involved in setting this up. Um, and so I, I want to read the names. Of course, Frank Rita and, and Bill Lansbury have been the sponsors along the way for this. The group leads uh, for the working group have is uh, R. Danielle Henriquez and Leon Silver. Um, they, they were the facilitators in this. And then we had the working group members, Matt Wilk, Amanda Pecora, Anna Verma, Kristen Lepping, Joni loftus Quilaro, Janae Baker, Tim DeVito, Aaron Bowzik, Carrie Budnovich, Steve Camo. And I'm, I hope I didn't miss others. I'm sure there are others behind the scenes in there as well. I want to ex directly express my appreciation to, to all of you. Again, as we've done with a lot of other areas of our operation, you had to pivot very, very quickly with this event. Um, we started out with a day that we were gonna spend together. 
Um, and I'm, I'm very happy with, with where we've ended up to, to accommodate. One of our priorities, uh, my priorities has been uh, very focused on building us as a community, our profession, um, our IT support, how we operate, who we are. Um, and one of the steps in doing so was to create opportunities and opportunity to come together uh, as, as a community. And that, that was the, the, the primary goal for the day where we could uh, spend a day learning from each other, getting to know each other from all aspects of the institution. Uh, I imagine one day we will, we will be able to get together in person, um, but, but this is a very nice alternative where we will create snippets of time over the next several months where we can come together around specific topics. Um, and, and we are launching that today. And I'm, I'm very excited about that. I am glad that, that we're able to open this up to, to so many people. And we're, we're trending upwards of 225 people joining today. So I'm very happy about that. Um, today, uh, you know, we're gonna focus on um, some key themes, our series. Um, again, our, our goals are to connect, learn, and share with one another. We'll start that today. We'll hear, hear from Vlad. Um, you know, promoting the idea of, of an IT profession and one IT. The format will be online, smaller chunks of information, a series over time. We'll have different guest uh, speakers, different opportunities for collaboration and, and feedback. Um, and so I, I am excited to see, um, you know, how this progresses and, and to, to hear from all of our colleagues. So today is focused on um, collaboration done right. That's the title, leveraging Office 365 and Microsoft Teams. Um, Frank is gonna introduce the speaker. Vlad, I'm sure many of you have, have worked with Vlad um, and he'll, he'll get into to Vlad's background. Um, you know, this tool, as I, as I talked about earlier, is a key tool in, in our ability to be remote. Um, and so the timing is perfect to uh, share this information, especially as we think through the next six months or more in terms of what comes next, uh, in terms of what mo mode we'll, we will be in for the fall. So I hope you enjoy it. I'm sure there's gonna be good questions and, and activity in the chat rooms. And again, I, I, I look forward to, to future sessions. I thank the working group and I thank all of you for, for your hard work um, so far. So thanks, and I'm going to turn it back over to Frank. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michelle, for getting us started here today. And as Michelle indicated, now it's time for our special guest speaker. Uh, Vladimir Gabrielescu is our self-proclaimed email wrangler at Rutgers. He and his colleagues have helped to coalesce Rutgers administrative emails from hundreds of systems onto a single system that provides security, convenience, and utility that goes far beyond the capabilities we previously worked with here at Rutgers. I've worked with Vlad for many years, and I've found him to be both extremely knowledgeable and very practical in the application of his expertise. He has frequently offered sound advice and guidance to me over the years, and he is here to share some of that wisdom with all of us today. So please welcome Vladimir Gabrielesk. Thank you for that, Frank. That was a very nice introduction. And I turn my camera on so you guys can all see me working from my spare bedroom. Uh, and I'm probably, probably gonna promptly turn it back off uh, to not annoy all of you with, uh, with my uh, green background. Um, thank you all for coming. The goal here, of course, is to talk about Microsoft Teams. So I'm going to share my screen with you all. And um, as we go through this process, Please use the Q&A area. Uh, we are gonna to try to address all the questions that are, that are gonna come up. Some of the questions may actually be addressed through the presentation, so we're not gonna necessarily answer them as we go through them. Uh, we'll, we'll hold all the questions for the end and cover them at that point. Okay, so let's talk about Microsoft Teams. We're gonna go through a lot of material and um, we're probably only going to scratch the surface of what is possible. The 
Reason for that is because we want to make sure we cover both the basics for those folks who haven't um, yet seen it or don't know much about it, but we also want to cover some of the more advanced topics that Microsoft Teams can offer you. So we hope to pique your interest, but we don't try to explain everything or cover everything. We just want to give you a background in what is possible. As we are going to cover a large number of topics, uh, we are going to split this presentation into three different sections and three different presenters. Uh, I am joined by my colleagues, Alisa and Zane, who will introduce themselves when they, when they take over the presentations. And we represent, obviously, OIT Messaging Collaboration Services. For those of you who don't know who Lisa, who Lisa and Zane are, you've probably communicated them at some point via Connect support, you just don't know it. They are some of the folks handling the, the, you know, a lot of the support calls, a lot of the administration of Office 365 and of Teams. Okay, so the agenda will, is meant to cover the basic topics we're gonna go over. Uh, obviously, we're gonna talk about what a, what a team is, what is the architecture of Microsoft Teams, the types of teams, how you manage teams, how you handle meetings in teams, application integrations, all the various features you might be able to use, and a number of use cases. I am terrified that we have put too much information in this presentation and we'll run out of time. So um, if I go too fast, by all means, somebody please remind me about it uh, in chat or get my attention and I'll try to slow down a bit. The entire presentation will be available online on um, the lecture series webpage, including the recording, the slide deck, which includes all the presenter notes as well. So we have actually copious amounts of presenter notes. So if you ever need to reference any of them, please go ahead and do so. You guys ready? You can't answer, I know, I'm sorry. Okay. All right, so what is Microsoft Teams? Microsoft Teams is the Office 365 collaboration application that brings all the features of 365 together, but it puts them in a different light. A lot of the 365 environment that you might be familiar with is focused on the um, end user experience, the single user experience. You know, you work in Outlook, you work in your calendar, and so on. Three, uh, Teams looks at the entire 365 ecosystem and recasts it as a group and team organizational uh, view of, of all your work. Superficially, for most users, the first time they're going to see it, they're going to see it as a chat based platform, but it's a lot more. Uh, it allows users to enhance teamwork by bringing all the various components together in one place. You can work synchronously or asynchronously, which is you know, something very important to us right now in our work environment and obviously in the educational environment as well. It is also very secure. Uh, I'll use that, that term simply because it is covered by our HIPAA agreements. It, is co it covers our FERPA agreements. It is high trust and SOC3 rated, which are not easy to achieve necessarily as, as as compliance regulations and uh, certifications go. It is also accessible from pretty much any platform you can imagine. You can use Microsoft Teams on Windows, on Mac OS, on the web, on, a, no, on Linux, on Android, on iOS, on everything. There's an application available for it on pretty much every um, operating system and platform you can imagine. And actually, when, I, when we talk about accessible, it's also good to keep in mind that accessible has multiple meanings. Microsoft Teams try to also address the issue of accessibility for users that may be differently abled or might have some limitations and or, or, you know, problems handling some of our existing tools. It is not perfect in any regards. Please, no, we're not claiming that it is the most accessible tool on the planet, but they do try. Microsoft is very committed to making uh, Microsoft Teams accessible uh, to everyone. There are a number of features built in that we're not going to go through in great depth that, that assists with that. So, what does it look like? Well, before you know what it looks like, I want to look at some stats. I apologize. So, we don't really advertise Microsoft Teams. We don't make a lot of announcement about it. We don't try to push it out there too much. We just offer it and sort of let itself, you know, be visible. And we have seen an amazing growth in the use of Microsoft Teams over the last few months. Uh, as you can see from our graph, we had a 400% increase in, in use um, since March. And it hasn't been abated. It seems to be keeping up and people are not just going away from it. They are using it every day. In the last 90 days, we had 15,000 active users and um, over 5,000 active channels within Teams. 
And we have 30 to 100 teams configured as of the time that I pulled those stats a couple of weeks ago. Obviously, statistics are always a bit of a hand wave, as you all know. Uh, many things can mean, you know, active. So Microsoft's definition of active is not somebody just logging in and looking at the tool. It is somebody actually interacting with it. That means posting in a channel, interacting with a file in the team, collaborating with somebody. It's an active involvement, not just a, I have a license and I logged in once. Okay, so what is really a team? Some of you may be very familiar with teams and some of you may not. And some of you may be familiar with the, with the concept uh, of unified groups in Office 365. This was a feature available from the first days of our conversion to Office 365. And it combined a share mailbox, a mailing list, a SharePoint site, trying to have some form of collaborative environment in the earlier days um, of the platform. However, Microsoft built up quite a bit in top of the unified groups when they added the Teams app as a feature of unified groups. But over time, Teams has overtaken the notion of unified groups completely. It has taken a life on its own. In fact, Microsoft is rebranding all of the existing group structures and the unified groups to now be um, Teams. All the old wording you might have heard before about unified groups or Office 65 groups, all of that is going away. They're going to call it all Teams because it is now their premier product on top of their uh, entire ecosystem. So you will actually see us update our documentation wherever we mention Microsoft Groups or Unified Groups to actually uh, to be renamed to Microsoft Teams. Each team provides it to its members access to a mailbox, although we'll talk a bit about that in a minute because depending on which type of team you select, you may or may not have a mailbox. A SharePoint site, share storage, and all the other collaboration tools that go along, such as Planner, OneNote, all of those various features are available within one application, which is the team application. If, in some ways, you can think of Outlook and OWA as the user-centric tools and Teams as the collaboration-centric tool that all work with the same underlying system and structure that you might already be familiar with. We should also mention that there are some legacy groups that you might have from the um, earlier days of Office 365, which do not have Teams enabled. But any new groups created will have Teams automatically enabled. And if you request, we can enable the uh, Teams for the previous groups as well. It's also important to know that Teams is licensed for all of our users at this point. It, this includes faculty, staff, students. Everybody has access to Microsoft Teams out of the box. And anybody can be a member of a team if invited. This includes external guests as well. So if you need to collaborate with external users, you can do that as well, and you can bring them into any conversation you want to bring them into. So there's a whole bunch of structural components that build up the Microsoft Teams environment. These are not all of them, but these are the main components that we're going to try to touch in some way or another, to some of them a bit less, some a bit more. So inherent to the Teams architecture, we have the team management structure. This involves uh, creation of teams, management of teams, controlling the membership, controlling access, control, and the related functions. The next way things you're going to see is the chat and conferencing interfaces. These are the way, you no, know, the basic communications that you guys may be used to from Skype for Business and whatnot. These are replacement for those tools. The ability to chat with another user or have a video conference with another user. Of course, then we have the notion of channels, which is the team organization component, which we'll go through a lot of that in a few minutes. Meetings, there are built-in meeting support within Microsoft Teams, and we'll go into a lot of depth on that. Each team has its own SharePoint site. So for those of you who want to leverage the power of SharePoint, you can, and you automatically get a SharePoint site created and associated with your team already pre-configured to, to only give access to your team members or those who you want to delegate it to. There is, of course, built-in shared storage. Uh, the shared storage for Microsoft for each team starts at one terabyte, but based on your requirements, we can expand it to up to 25 terabytes per team if, if you find you need it. We also have Microsoft Planner as part of each team, which, I'll, which we'll cover later on because it's a very powerful tool. Microsoft Stream, it's also part of it. Uh, for those of you who have never played with Stream, Stream is a uh, enterprise YouTube, for lack of a better explanation. It's a built-in video streaming service and video hosting service with its, entire, with its entire permission model attached to it as well. 
and it acts as the backing for all the recordings for, for uh, Microsoft Team meetings. And of course, as it's built on top of the Office platform, it also integrates with all the other cooperative editing tools, like all the Office products, PowerPoint, Word, et cetera, both online and desktop versions. So you can do collaborative editing directly in Teams, or you can see your team you know, collaborate no matter which one of the applications they are using. And you obviously can work across multiple teams from one interface. Uh, you don't have to log in and out or change your interface to, to work across multiple teams. Each team has its own security model and its own security privileges associated with each team. So you can easily isolate and control what everybody sees and what everybody has access to. And lastly, we have the ability to integrate with third party applications. And we'll give you a couple of examples of what we've done with that already and what's possible to do in the future. All of those are pretty words and boxes on the screen. So I'm going to actually launch into a series of slides now. For those of you who have never seen Teams, I'm going to give you guys a, a bit of a screenshot based um, review of what Teams looks like and how it works before we launch into the more advanced features. All right. So most users are probably going to, and by the way, throughout my, all my screenshots, I have used real life screenshots from my environment. I have made every possible effort to not show any private information. Uh, Anna is probably seeing that she's one of my favorites in my team's conversations. But beyond that, I've tried not to actually show private content. Um, if I apologize if anything there shows up that you might not expect. So the most likely thing people are going to encounter first is the one-on-one -on -one chat feature. The one-on-one -on -one chat feature is really there to um, replace. By the way, uh, I want to ask a question because somebody, something came up. Is the content washed out for you guys? Are you is everybody seeing this okay? Somebody, please let me know if there's any problems with the, with the display or anything, because I want to make sure that uh, it looks good for everybody. If it doesn't, I apologize, and we will show this, the the um, the slides with you, which are in better resolution. So um, even though that even if members are in members of a team yet, if they just install the app and start using it, they can instantaneously start being able to, to communicate with all their colleagues. The one on one chat application is automatically built in. Um, hmm. Let me see if I don't know if I can do anything about the contrast. I apologize about the fading. Um, let me see. I don't know if I can change that. I do apologize, uh, but I don't know if I have control over changing the uh, the resolution from my side. The uh, I mean, sorry, the the, the um, coloring. I'm going to try to do that. I apologize. Give me one second. Unfortunately, I don't know if I can control the um, the display settings to make it darker or lighter. Let me see if there's anything I can do about that. Do we need a lecture series on how to control the presentation mode and make the contrast better? Because unfortunately, I don't. It looks great on my machine, but I don't know why uh, why WebEx isn't doing the best job with that. Um, so, if anybody can suggest a way of fixing that, I, I would love to do it. Uh, I apologize if I don't have control over the contrast of the presentation. So, I'm going to try to explain it as it is. I apologize if the screenshots are not great. Um, they, I don't know what the presentation part is doing. So the, um, is there a way to change this? I don't know. Well, I apologize. I don't know how to fix it. I will try my best to, to explain what's on the screenshots. So again, as I said, the, the one on one chat part is the, the most likely thing for users to see first is the ability to converse with each other and uh, exchange information. It's anything from a Skype replacement to a text messaging replacement. Um, and is there not? I am told there's an advanced options. Do 
no. I can fix that. No, unfortunately, sharing this video actually made it worse in our experiments. So I, I don't know that I have a good way of fixing that right now. All right. So when, we, when we're talking about the chat part, is not just about chatting one on one. You can actually automatically create group chats. Uh, you can add anybody you want to a conversation, even if they don't have a team pre created. So the basic chat interface is, is pretty handy by itself. So, but it's not really dependent on teams existing. The team's app versus the team constructs within it are different ideas. And I know that's going to sound a bit confusing because they call teams the app and teams the uh, components which make up teams. So stick with me. I hope that will make more sense by the end of the, of the presentation. Keep in mind that all chats, even personal ones, are all logged and can be referenced later by any of the members of the, of the chat, including, and this is the part I like, any attachment or documents you might have shared or you might have used as part of your conversation actually are retained. So you can always go re review those later. You don't have to remember where you put that file or what happens to it. It's, it stays attached to that particular conversation. Okay, you can also search for all your contacts. So all the various, um, the global address list you might already be used to from your um, Office staff environment, from your Outlook contacts and whatnot, it's also automatically available in your uh, Teams application. For example, you can just start typing into the search box, I'm looking for Stan, my manager, and I can immediately find Stan's contact information there. Um, by the way, that search bar is really, really handy because it lets you do all sorts of things. You may want to try the slash and add commands for additional functionality that's built into it. So when you search for somebody, you don't only find them to start a conversation. You actually can get a whole bunch of information about that user. For example, if you have your organizational chart configured, you can actually see the entire org chart associated with that person. You can see all the files you have shared with that person. And you can also see all the activity of your contact in all the teams that you have had access to. So if you are both members of different teams and you have had a chat history, the activity stream will show you all the information about that user across all the various teams and all the various chat uh, uh, conversations you might have had with that user. So that's a really handy way to go reference all the documents or find what somebody has said about a subject across the entire team structure. Of course, once you create a team, and we'll talk about team creation later, within teams, you can have multiple channels. Now we're talking about the group collaboration part of, the, of, of, of teams. Each team starts with one default channel, the general channel, but you can create as many channels as you want. I think it's 300. If you need more than 300 channels in the team, you probably should reconsider whether you need one team or, or more than one team. And channels can be created, deleted, or archived as needed. If you no longer need a channel, you can archive it, in which case all the information is retained, but no new information can be added to it, or you can delete them. As an individual user, you can also choose to ignore certain channels. So if you are a member of a large team with many channels and you broke it down into various components and you have no interest in one or the other of the channels, you can set them on your ignore list and you'll never see it. Think of channels as being rooms in your private team's house, right? Um, and you can remodel your house on the fly. You can change your channels, rename them, create a new one, archive all ones, depending how you want to do that. Um, you can set moderation on channels. You can restrict sharing in channels. Um, and you can even have a email address associated with the channel, which we'll talk about later, because you can have each channel receive email and post to the channel automatically if you want to. Of course, you have to be careful who you share that email with, because while you probably don't want, it's all the spam in the world being posted to your channel, but it's a fairly obscure email address. There's actually a lot of information on this screen that, unfortunately, you may or may not be able to see it, and I apologize. For example, you can see which teams have had new activity. You can see which channels have had new activity. 
you can see uh, channels where you are mentioned with at mentions. There's a whole bunch of contacts that's being provided on the screens all the time that may take you guys a bit of time to figure out what all the various icons means. For example, if you look um, on the uh, list of channels, you will notice that one of the channels has a um, lockbox around it. That channel is a private channel. Not everybody in the team has access to it. This channel has new messages in it. In this particular conversation, I had an at mention for, for my particular my name, so I can find that. I got an alert in the upper right corner that there have been alerts in general for my um, to my name, so I know I have to go look for them. So there's a whole bunch of information hidden all over the place in these screens as you go through them. I can't go through all of them because we're never going to finish. The um, next part. There's a different styling choice as well between chats and channels. You can think of the chat layout of being more SMS-like, if anything, right? You have a more one-on-one um, -on -one flow of conversation. And you can think of the uh, styling of the conversations in channels. Um, the best I can describe it is, is Facebook-style conversation. They are focused on conversations and replies to the conversations, and not so much on a free flow uh, form um one line or conversation of course you can use it that way it's just not necessarily how it's it, it's best styled the other thing you can do is you can include a lot of content in each conversation you can have a lot of different content types added so for example you can um add new channels, uh, to each channel you can add new tabs, which can hold a whole bunch of different things like files and presentation notebooks. Like in my case, I have a OneNote notebook added there. But also within the channels themselves, you can share files, you can create polls within each channel. Every time you have files added or attached to a conversation in the channel, they are automatically added to the files storage area for each channel. You don't have to remember to upload them into a different location. You don't have to remember to save them somewhere. They are automatically attached to that team and specific to that channel. So every channel has its own directory, its own storage directory, and they all reside in the SharePoint site for the, uh, for the team. And you can find them all under the Files tab. So um, the same is true for OneNote. So if you create a notebook attached to each channel, it would also be stored associated only with that channel, but also with the entire team in the SharePoint site. You may also be a member of multiple teams, and the team apps grant you access to all of them at once. As you can see on the left, I have a list of all the teams I am a member of, and I can switch between them at will without having to leave the application or do anything fancy. There are two views of this. The default view, it's actually, a, I'm going to show the next slide, which is the default view of the Teams layout. You can choose whether you want, you want to browse your Teams in this mode, where you have the um, bigger, easier to see blocks, or if you want to use the, um, the more compact view. Personally, I prefer the more compact view, obviously, and that's what I've used in my screenshots, but other folks prefer the, uh, the blockier view of, of their team list. Teams, however, goes beyond that. If you look on the left-hand side of your inter Teams interface, you notice you have a Files option. The File option gives you access to all the files you may have, you may have seen across all the various Teams you are a member of. In and it also includes all the files you have access to in your Office 65 environment, whether they were shared in the team or not. So if I look under Files under the, under the Recent, I will see every file I have recently worked on. If I click on the Microsoft Teams specific bar, I will only see the files that were part of Teams activity. Further, you can add other cloud storage um, options to your Teams environment. Uh, currently, OneDrive is the default, but you can add Box or Google Drive as additional storage sources. So you can take files from your, from your Box account and your ScalaMail account and attach them into a team directly. Just be careful if you do that with links if you don't move the file or upload the file into the team, 
you have to make sure the permissions are set correctly on the source file as well, because teams will not automatically reach back into your external storage and update the permissions on it. Your calendar is also available, so your personal calendar can be pulled into the uh, Teams application as well. By the way, it does not have access to shared accounts from here, so it's only your calendar that's visible. And that's the basic overview of the various interfaces. However, there's a lot more. I just wanted to give you guys a bit of a taste of what the application looks like for those who haven't seen it. And I'm going to, at this point, pass the baton over to Liz, who is going to speak about how we create teams, how we manage teams, and how we deal with meetings. Uh, all I have to do is figure out how to actually pass the baton. One second, please. Ah, the screen has gotten huge. Thank you, Vlad. Now let me just take a second to share my screen. Hopefully I don't have the same issue. Um, if there's an issue with the slides you're seeing, of course, please let me know, but um, just mention it in the chat and I will take a closer look at it. But hello everyone. <laughs> my name is Alyssa. Uh, Vlad briefly introduced me. I work really closely with Office 365 products in our environment. And I've been handling Connect support a lot with Zane as well. Um, I've been staring at Teams a lot <laughs> the past few months. So hopefully I can uh, spread a little bit more information about this product as we're really excited about it. And we're really happy to see that more people are using it. So one of the biggest questions we've gotten since we turned on self-creation in February is what is the difference between the types of teams you can create? So if you're looking to make a team for yourself, it's really important to know the differences between the two. Um, this type of self-creation that we've enabled is available for everybody, students, faculty, staff. Uh, you can make it right from the Teams application, but they're a bit different from the teams that we're used to or the teams that we're familiar with. Um, I'll go over how to actually create the teams in the upcoming slides, but let me just briefly go over the differences between the two. So when a team is created, there's always going to be an email address that is created or associated with it. This is because teams, as mentioned by Vlad, are an expansion of Microsoft 365 groups. So when we're configuring, when we were configuring self-created teams, we wanted to figure out a way where we could allow users to create these, these teams without sacrificing any of the namespace within Rutgers Connect. Uh, so our solution was to put these teams that are self-created into their own teams.ruckers.edu domain. Uh, however, it's important to keep in mind that this decision has no effect on the user and their self-created team. This is because unlike the teams we're familiar with that are based off of these 365 groups, uh, Self-created teams do not appear as groups in your Office 365 mailbox. They don't really come with a mailbox that's visible and that you can interact with. The purpose of these teams are to solely utilize the team's collaborative space. So everything is ideally done right within teams. If you'd like to access a group with a mailbox, um, you know, that also has a team's component, we wouldn't really recommend self-created teams for this case. Uh, Self-created teams are really for personal projects. I'll go into that a little bit more, but if a user comes to you and has an issue with a self-created team, and again, you can identify that based on the teams.ruckers domain, if you have access to the Connect Admin tool, or if they don't have a mailbox associated, the help desk are the administrators for the teams.ruckers.edu domain. So uh, they would be the official support group. And of course, you can also ask Connect support. The other type of team that we create is referred to as departmental teams. That's the name we've, we've given it internally. These are what you may be more familiar with as IT professionals. So these are groups in Microsoft 365. Um, groups are, if, if you're not familiar with it briefly, they are a, a feature in Microsoft 365 that let you select or um, collaborate with a group of people. Uh, there's a bunch of resources that come with it, such as an inbox, a shared calendar, a document library. Uh, we've also given the ability to have a team with these groups. So 
we consider these to be departmental teams. Users can request to have these created, but they can only be created by delegated administrators. So they vary from self-created teams because uh, they can only be generated through the Connect Admin tool. Um, unlike self-created teams, the email address of the group can be explicitly defined and mapped to your department's domain. Uh, so you can have it in at OIT or whichever domain you prefer. There's a bit more flexibility with the naming and you can collaborate in a shared mailbox space. Um, please keep these differences in mind. Our recommendation would be to utilize self-created teams for temporary or personal projects. Um, I use my self-created team space where as a way where I can view all my planner items and just throw my documents in. Um, if at any time a self-created team needs to be converted, uh, Connect Support has that ability, so just let us know. I'm just going to briefly show you a video that will walk you through the process on how you can self-create a team. So to start, of course, you'll need to have the Teams application downloaded, or you'll need to visit teams.office.com and log in. But once you are logged in, make sure you are clicking on the Teams tab in the left corner and changing the view so you can view all of your teams at once. Then in the top right, oh, excuse me, let me move this if anybody can see that. Uh, you should select join or create a new team, which can be done, like I said, right from the Teams application. And once you click on that button, it should pull up a list of all of the teams. Well, this Teams tab will show you all the list of teams that you are in. And then you should be able to click join or create a new team. Hopefully, okay. Sorry about that. And then you can see the teams that you can uh, join or request to join because they are public. And then there's also the option to create a team. Now, this is a, another question we get a lot, selecting a team type. I'll go over that in a little bit in the next slide. The general default uh, uh, selection that you'll wanna pick is other because it'll let you create a team with a blank slate. And here is where you can fill out the team name, the team description, choose whether you want it to be private or public. There's also two really interesting features that you can also click on when you're creating a new team. If you already have a team set up in mind with the certain applications that you want, the tabs that you want, uh, Microsoft actually lets you basically create a copy of a team that you already have. So this will carry over all the tabs, like I mentioned, the settings, um, and you can create a new team this way. It doesn't, it's important to know, it doesn't uh, copy over messages or anything like that or files. It's just the layout if you want a really quick and easy way to create a team that you're comfortable with. It lets you basically make a copy of an existing team. So it's a really nice feature. And you'll see once the team is created, it'll ask you for who you want to add to the team. Um, Teams lets you do guest collaboration. So you just have to enter the email address of the external account it'll show up as a guest. And then, you know, you can add your internal users. It lets you decide whether you want them to be a member or an owner. You can change that right there. Once you're done, hit close. And there is your team. This one has a lot more to it because again, we copied it from an existing team. So you can see that the, the tabs are there, the channels are there, the settings should be the same, but I'll, I'll show you what it looks like to create a team with a, a brand new blank slate. So again, we're gonna select other, enter the team name, the team description. And the second option on the bottom, we went over using a template, but you can also create a team with an existing group. So that's also a really nice thing it lets you do. If there's a group already there that doesn't have a team associated with it, you can check that. Um, but for all intents and purposes, let's just create a brand new team right from the Teams app. Again, we selected other, so it would be a, a blank slate. I'm going to skip adding people to it for now. And this is what it looks like. So let me just pause this really quick here. Yeah, it's the end of it. So 
this is what a generic self-created team will look like. You have your default general channel, you have your posts section and a file section. So again, this is a self-created team, not to get it confused with departmental teams. So next slide, I'm going to show you how to let's see. Oh, sorry, I replayed the video. Yeah, okay, so the next slide. You should have seen this when we were creating a new team. There are a few different types of teams that you can create when you're self-creating a team. I know the, the vocabulary is getting a little mixed up here, but to not get it confused, these are considered as templates for uh, self-created teams. So you have a class temp template, which is best suited generally for teachers or teaching assistant collaboration. Um, ideally, the TA or a teacher would be an owner of these class teams. Um, something important to note, though, is we do not have, there's a component called assignments and also quizzes that are in these class teams or class team templates. We do not have that configured in our environment. This is so uh, to avoid any conflicts with existing learning management systems. Uh, but there are other tabs that come with it, such as a, a shared OneNote um, and shared file space for teachers and students to collaborate in. There is also professional learning communities. Um, this was kind of created with educators in mind. Um, new educators can be added at any time. There's a OneNote. There's, I think it comes with Planner, but you can also add Planner and Power BI if it's not there. Again, these are just templates that come with it, but it's important to know that when you create a team, a self-created team with one of these templates, you're pretty much stuck with it. I don't, there's not too much configuration around it because this is the type of team that you've chosen to create. But if you don't like it, you always have the option to delete a self-created team right from the application and then, you know, create a new one that you're comfortable with. Uh, staff templates come with OneNote as well, um, a few different channels and configuration options, but we always recommend just sticking with other and then customizing it to your uh, fitting with applications like SharePoint, OneDrive, OneNote. We'll go over that more later, but I just want to reiterate that it's important to note that once you choose a template, you cannot change it once it's created that we figured at this time. So. If you don't like the template, just start over fresh and uh, work it out with the other selection. It gives you the most flexibility. Another notable difference between the two types of teams is their deprovisioning policies. So as we mentioned, self-created teams, anybody can, can create them, delete them, access them. Um, but if there is no activity in the team for 400 days, the team will be uh, marked as inactive with notice. They do send out notifications. So after 400 days, a team owner or owners will receive an email notification from Microsoft stating that their team will expire in X amount of time. So the first notice is 30 days prior. Second notice is 15. The final notice is one day prior. And if there's no owner for a self-created team, We've set it so that the help desk will receive these notifications. So we have logs of that in case anybody comes to us and has any questions. Um, but an owner can manually renew their teams in the team's application by going to their team setting and clicking on expiration or by just having some activity in the team that resets it completely. Um, if an owner performs an action, the group will be automatically renewed by one lifetime. So another 400 days. Um, these actions include things such as viewing, editing, or downloading, sharing, <laughs> uploading files to the group, or you can just write in the channel. Um, groups that aren't renewed after 400 days, they will be soft deleted for 30 days and then deleted permanently. So um, this is the same policy for self-created teams that are deleted by an owner. They will be recoverable for up to 30 days then they are unrecoverable. If there are any questions about, you know, if, if you forget this, this is all on the 
Microsoft Teams subpage of the Rutgers IT website um, under information for delegated administrators. So, um, but departmental teams have no expiration policy. They stay active. So again, this is something to keep in mind if you're looking to create a team for your organization or just for yourself. Uh, these are important differences. So now that we've created our team, we can configure it in a number of different ways. This video will show you how you can manage your team. Um, there's a lot of options, so let's jump right into it. Okay, so we have our team. You can access the team settings by clicking on the ellipses in the top right and clicking on Manage Team. When uh, you select Manage Team, it'll pull up a bunch of different tabs. Um, also in that section, you could see there is a bunch of different options as well, but the first one the first tab in the team settings just shows you the owners, the members, even guests. Uh, you can't exactly change the uh, role of a guest, but you can of members and owners. Um, there's also a tags feature, which is really nice. It might remind you of Slack where you can mention a certain group or, or certain people, and um, it's a really useful tool. Pending requests is more for public channels. If somebody's requesting to join your team, um, <clears throat> channels shows you all the channels you have, and um, you can hide certain channels from users. You can also see deleted channels, and uh, you can restore them easily if you've deleted them in the past. You can hide channels. You can show them for certain people. There are two different types of channels. There's standard public ones, and there's private channels. There's a lot of configuration options here. Um, when you click on the more options for each channel, it actually pulls up um, a way to email the channel um, as well as getting channel notifications. And you can delete a channel from there as well. So you can see there's also the option on the left hand side as well. Same options. Settings has the most amount of configuration. You can change the picture of your team. Um, you can also manage the permissions of each member, who can upload, who can delete, who can create. This gives you a lot of different uh, ways to uh, manage your team on a department le departmental level. There's guest permissions. These are specific to external users. Um, there's also a way to see or to manage, excuse me, who can mention a team or who can mention a channel. So that's a really useful tool. Team code is really nice. It lets you generate a code that people can input when they're clicking on that create a team button that we saw earlier and automatically join the team. It's a really easy way to share your team. Um, then there's fun stuff, enabling gifts and whatnot, um, and tags who can add tags. So. Um, tags are really useful. You can get the attention of a select number of people. My favorite part is the analytics section. Um, unfortunately, this team was just for testing, so there's not too much activity going on here. But as you can see, there's so much information. Uh, how many posts were made in a day? Uh, how much engagement? Who was the active user on June 15th? Uh, meeting activity. There is a lot of interesting analytics here that are not just for the whole team. You can see also there's a, a extensive timeline up to the last 90 days, um, but you can also see the analytics of specific channels, which is also really cool. You can see, you know, uh, what days were you most active. There's also applications. You can see what apps are configured in your team. We'll go over more of that later, but just to give you a visual off the bat, there are a lot of products you, you, that are integrated with Teams that you can integrate in your own team when you create it. So, uh, and briefly, just to show you, there's also channel permissions, which are separate from Teams permissions. This is what the general uh, permissions look like. Every channel has a general um, chat room. It's default. So those are the settings for the default channel. These are the settings for a channel that you've created that you've listed as public. You can set up channel moderation. Who can manage um, messages that are sent to this channel? It, it goes it goes deep, not to overwhelm you, but there are a lot of permissions you can grant or take away. Um, 
especially in private teams too, you can see who is, or excuse me, private uh, channels. It, it kind of looks a lot like its own team, if you think about it, a bit of a rabbit hole. The settings look very similar to a team's settings. Uh, private channels have a lot more restrictions um, that you can set up. So uh, yeah, it, it, it kind of mirrors that <laughs> the team settings here, but uh, hopefully I didn't confuse any of you with all that, but just, just as a visual, there are a lot of different ways you can set up permissions for your, for your team. Okay. As we've mentioned, you can invite external guests to both a self-created team and a departmental team. Uh, you can collaborate with them in meetings. So if you just create a meeting in teams, you can also invite guests. Um, guests, again, in this context, refer to external addresses, not Rutgers addresses or Scarlet Mail users. They are considered internal in this case. Um, the guest experience is a bit different from our own, though. There are limitations by design. So guests cannot create or browse or revise teams in our environment. Um, they can't access calendars of other teams. They can't schedule meetings in our environment. Uh, there's limitations for OneDrive and a lot more. There's a lot more limitation, uh, limitations. They can't one-on-one -on -one chat with uh, users not in their contact list from our environment. Um, if they are invited to a meeting, they will be asked to provide their name and will not be able to view all the com components of the meeting uh, afterwards. So there are a lot of restrictions when it comes to this. As for retention policy, We've gotten a few questions about this in the past. Um, all actions are logged and can be e-discovered. This goes across the board for all of our Microsoft 365 products. So um, remember you can modify the positions of, or um, excuse me, permissions of a guest or a member uh, with these limitations in mind. And I'm sorry if I'm going a little fast, I'm trying to keep us in our time limit here. <clears throat> But as I mentioned, Teams has meetings and it's a really great built-in meetings component. We use it a lot. Um, Teams live events, they, that's a, um, an, a component of Teams meetings, if you will. Uh, it allows you to enable um, broadcasting so you can broadcast to larger audiences. Right now, they have extended the limit of attendees to 20,000 until July 1st. Um, this is going to be brought back down to 10,000 um, after that point, but live events in Teams, basically it, it lets you have multiple roles like organizers, such as this live event, pretty much, uh, presenter, attendees, um, there's a Q&A, and, &A, and a, a really nice feature of this meeting, of meetings in Teams, is that everything is uploaded to Microsoft Stream. I'll go over that a little bit later, but Teams lets you create meetings at any time impromptu meetings. So on the fly, you want to create a meeting really quickly to talk to your channel mates. You can do that right through the application. You can also schedule meetings ahead of time. I'll show you a little bit about how that looks like. But the big feature I want to touch upon before moving on is you can participate in multiple meetings. What this means is let's say you are in a meeting and you see that you've been double booked. So you want to check up on your one meeting, but you don't want to leave the current meeting that you're already in, in Teams. When you do this, also it's important to mention that while you're in a meeting, you can open up your chat, you can look at Teams, it, it continues the meeting, nothing changes on that front. If you want to check in on another meeting, the present meeting that you're in, it puts you on hold and other users can see that you're on hold while you enter a new meeting and you can bounce right back. It's really quick and easy. Um, I think it's a great tool because it doesn't, you know, say that you've left. It just marks you as on hold, but you'll be right back pretty much. So it's a really nice feature. And all meetings can be uploaded to Microsoft Stream. This doesn't mean that it is. It gives you the option to, you can record meetings. Um, there's auto transcription, so live captions. I'll show you an example of that a little later, but it's a really neat tool. We've been testing it for a while. It looks great. It's 99% it's of the time really accurate. Um, in stream, after you've uploaded it or after it's been uploaded, you can add closed captions. You can share the video with other members if they've missed it, if you decide to record it. 
Um, and when these meetings are uploaded to stream, only group members will have access. You can change that access in stream. Um, I won't go over, this presentation isn't about stream, but the two applications, they work hand in hand. So um, it's a really neat functionality because uh, it keeps all the collaboration tools in one space. Um, and you can look at it at any time afterwards. So it's, it's, it's really nice to have. So this video will just show you a little bit about what a meeting looks like if you've never partaken in a meeting in Teams. I'll try to go over uh, both meeting, impromptu meetings, and scheduled meetings. So this video will touch upon that a little bit. So if you want to schedule a meeting right away in your team, you can click on the Meet Now button at the very bottom. Give it a name, and you can meet right away. People can join. Again, this is within the team itself. Um, it also gives you the option to schedule a meeting in the future. This will pull up something that looks a lot like Rutgers Connect events when you're creating them. You can change the time. You can decide which team are you creating this meeting in. Where can you join this meeting and what uh, team's location? Uh, so this is more for if you want to have your team's members join you in a meeting. Um, and then if you send it, I'll show you what it looks like when it's in the chat. So again, we created it for just the team. And then you can see I scheduled a meeting for later on. It sends a notice to your team and you can see it on your calendar. So again, your calendar only shows you, oh, and also to mention, it alters the body of the event with additional information if you need it. You might have seen that in a lot of events. Um, I'll go over that a little bit later, but the calendar shows you your meetings, only your calendar. So let's say you want to make a Teams meeting right from your calendar. You can click and drag, just like in Rutgers Connect. Create uh, your title, add your attendees. So as you can see, the body of the message is empty right now. But when you create the team, it'll show up on your calendar. And when you open it up, well, sorry, <laughs> you saw it I'll show you in a little bit. But you can also schedule meetings in the top right corner, live events and schedule meetings. And as I mentioned, live events are for bigger presentations. You can also click Meet Now pulls up a meeting right away. It'll show you the devices you have set up. Uh, this is for impromptu meetings, by the way. This is for, I want to meet right now, clicked on the Meet Now button, create the name of the team, and uh, this is what it will look like. You'll have your participants on the right. You'll have your uh, place in the middle where all your webcams or there will be. I think it's up to seven now they have seven cameras. I know they're trying to extend it, um, the amount of webcams you can see in the interface at a time. There's a chat component that you can easily access. If you want to invite people to a meeting, you can type them in the top right. Here I decided to call Vlad, and he promptly hangs up on me. <laughs> But you can dial people right away, right there. Um, there's also an option to grab the invite link in the top right. You can download an attendance list. So who was present at the meeting? So you can have a list right away. Um, there's the raise your hand feature. So there's a, it, not to overwhelm me. There's a lot of components of the meeting. Um, the ellipses will pull up the most. You can start your recording up to, to Microsoft Stream. You'll get a notice, much like other streaming platforms, they notify everyone. Um, you can uh, show meeting notes if you've been taking meeting notes. Uh, and at the top, it'll tell you that the recording has been saved to Microsoft Stream. Live captions. Uh, I don't think I talk in this video, so I can't really show that the live captions there, but. Um, there are a lot of really neat options to uh, configure with a meeting. <clears throat> and once you're done with the meeting, everything will save at the end in your chat window. You can refer to it later on. Um, all the information talked about in the meeting, in the, in the chat at least, will be stored in your chat section. You can preview it later on. 
Um, and uh, yeah, so the meeting, when it's recorded, you'll be able to click on it and see it right away. Sorry again if I'm going fast. <laughs> I'm realizing I'm talking a lot, so I'm trying to quickly get through it. But if you have any questions, please use the Q&A and we'll get to it at the end. Now let's take a look at what a meeting looks like um, when you schedule it from your Office 365 calendar. Uh, I use this a lot more than scheduling meetings right from Teams. Uh, it's really useful and really quick and easy. Uh, you just open up your calendar and click and drag an event. That's at least what I do. <laughs> and name your event. When you click on more options, um, that's where you'll have the ability to specify that this meeting will take place in Teams. Add online meeting, select Teams meeting, update everything and hit save. What this will do, as I mentioned before, or you can click on new event in the top right, create Teams meeting. Um, again, I just click and drag, but <laughs> both ways work. After you specify that it's going to be in Teams, there will be a join button that shows right after you create it. And also when you look in the description, you'll see that it's been updated with uh, a link to join the Teams meeting for anybody who's been invited to the event, as well as a conference ID and phone number. Before I move on, I just want to explain that the phone number option is only available right now for specific video conferencing licenses. So if you don't have this license, please reach out to your delegate administrator or delegate administrators, contact us. We are offering this for free for a short amount of time due to telecommuting, um, but we will revisit this you know, at, at a later time for all those who have this option to see who, who still needs it. We'll have that discussion later on, but right now you, for general Teams licenses or Office 365 licenses, it actually doesn't come with the phone number. If this is something you want or your team wants, please let us know and we'll look into it further. <clears throat> There's also other options to click on at the bottom as well. Now I'll show you what it looks like in Outlook. This one's a lot easier. Um, from the home page of your calendar, there's an option right there. There should be an option in newest versions to set up a new Teams meeting. Um, this actually appears right away when you create the, create the meeting, the link and the phone numbers and information. So uh, very quick and easy. You can do it right from Office 365 and uh, it's a simple tool. So <clears throat> hopefully this isn't whitewashed and hopefully you can all see every option. Really quick, we've talked about most of these, um, but just as a visual, you can see all the perks of Microsoft Teams meetings. Uh, you can blur or change your background. You can actually directly call other people. I didn't show a video of that, but um, instead of meetings or setting up meetings, you can easily uh, call other users right through Teams. You can download the app and join meetings that way through your phone or you can call other people in Teams through your phone. <clears throat> There's polls and forms through form, polls and forms through Microsoft Forms that you can collaborate with. Um, meeting notes, live captioning. There's a whiteboard as well. Um, it, it, it's 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 uh, got a lot of great features. I use it all the time. Um, and of course, if you have any questions about these features, let us know. Now, before I end, <laughs> this isn't the, the greatest example of live captioning, but you'll see on the very bottom here, uh, I made a bit of a cameo, um, but on the bottom here, uh, you can see this is what the live captioning will look like. It'll show up here um, as the person's talking. It's actually pretty accurate. I don't have all the st statistics on it, but from what we've been testing and seeing, it's actually really great so long as you know the, the microphone is clear and and you can hear the person very well um, this is what the raise hand feature will look like to a meeting organizer if somebody has their hand raised it'll look like that a nice little hand animation um, and the blur background feature i chose a fun uh, vibrant <laughs> background here um, but there's a, a bunch of different options there's just a blurred background uh, uh, normal backgrounds you can uh, select from a wide variety if you want to change it at any point, 
you can do that after clicking on the ellipses and uh, that'll give the option to change the background effects if um, you don't like it. Though I am alone on this call, and it may seem a little silly, <clears throat> meeting with yourself is actually a really useful tool. Um, by this, I mean when you're recording yourself during a meeting. So let's say I set up a meeting with myself and I start recording. Um, you can easily make a presentation, conduct a lesson for others, or record a training video. Because as I said, all these recordings are uploaded to Microsoft Stream, which you can easily share, download, a uh, great uh, option and tool for users who just want to record themselves or take notes or something like that. Um, or you can embed the videos into a presentation from stream. There's a lot of different things and hopefully you all stuck with me through this and I didn't overwhelm anybody. But um, with all that being said, hopefully I taught you a little bit more about meetings and about how to create a team. I'm going to pass things off now to my colleague Zane. He is very uh, familiar with all the integrations in Teams, and uh, we're, we're really lucky to have him. So hopefully he can teach you a little bit more about uh, the different integrations in Teams. And thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I hope you can see me. Um, my name is Zane Siddiqui, and I'll be covering some of the important applications we can integrate with Microsoft Teams, um, along with some really neat and useful features that are built uh, into the platform. All right, so uh, with Microsoft Power Automate, which was formerly known as Microsoft Flow, you can automate time-consuming and repetitive tasks we all dread. You can integrate your favorite applications to do many things, such as collect data, synchronize files, and send notifications. Not only can you create, manage, and view your workflows right within Teams, but you can leverage your team's data to set up channel-specific messages, automate your team's approval processes, or use the flow bot to instantly trigger workflows. For instance, you can tell the bot to run a workflow that automatically identifies newly created documents and notifies a channel asking members to review them at their own time. The next application I would like to cover is Microsoft Forms. If you wanna take a quick poll or survey a set of participants with a click of a button, you can instantly create a form and get a tally of your results. Another great feature is that you can allow team members to answer the survey anonymously. You can also have the results of the survey displayed in a channel in real time. Though Teams has its own conferencing functionality, if you prefer to host your meetings using Cisco WebEx, you can utilize the WebEx application to start, join, and manage your meetings directly in Teams. You can even invite all your channel members at once with a click of a button or have the meeting invite visible in a channel conversation. Also, the WebEx application can automatically post meeting recordings within a channel as soon as your meeting is finished. We're also looking forward to a future Zoom integration with Teams as well. The GitHub application gives developers the ability to hold in-context conversations on repositories, issues, and pull requests without ever leaving Teams. You can set up notifications for specific activities that occur in your repository from actions such as adding comments, viewing the repository in GitHub, closing, and even merging pull requests directly from the notification card in Teams. For example, say you receive a pull request notification, you can click on the close button and simply close the request without having to navigate to the GitHub website. For those out there that are project managers, the Smartsheet application allows you to share dashboards and reports right within Teams. You can even send alerts to a channel on key dates and deliverables, which eliminates all the unnecessary email traffic. Those out there that are developers may find webhooks pretty interesting as it will allow uh, you to use your applications within Teams. Incoming webhooks will display uh, these cool adaptive cards with rich text and um, dynamic information. Now I'll demonstrate some functionality of using Power Automate in Teams. Um, this is uh, 
quick demonstration of how to set up a flow in Power Automate that posts a welcome message to a channel when a new member is added to a team. Uh, this is a one-time setup that is required in order to have this flow run each time you have a new member. So first, uh, you can add uh, an open Power Automate in a separate tab by clicking on the plus icon at the top of the channel. So I'm gonna go ahead and just click save here. Um, after adding the app, you can see a screen containing flows you've created along with some preset flows you can quickly use for your team. So um, I'm gonna click new and automated from blank and I'll give the flow a name. Um, and then I'll use the when a new member is added trigger for teams. Feel free to explore the various connectors and triggers available. Um, then you can select a team you would like the flow to trigger for. After that, you can set up an action, get user profile. Um, this allows us to retrieve information about the new member so that you can really personalize your welcome message later. And lastly, you can use the action post a message as a flow bot to a channel and pick which team and channel you would like to post a message into. In the message box, you can specify the contents of the message you would like to post and dynamic information such as a new member's display name in the message if you would like. And that's it. You can click the save button and your flow will now trigger every time a new member is added to the team. Um, creating a poll within Teams using the Microsoft Forms application is a breeze. I'm just going to play the video here. First, uh, by selecting the three dots at the bottom of the conversation area, you can find the Forms app. Um, once you click on the Forms application, it will open up a create a new poll dialog box, and uh, you can specify the answer and question choices. And after hitting the save, uh, you can preview your poll and either go back and just or uh, hit send, and it'll send directly into a channel. Um, Teams also supports integrations with external software and products. For example, here we see an image of an automated feed of information from ServiceNow when records are changed. In this instance, we have used updates from the Agile module in ServiceNow, updating a team channel when a new user story is created or updated. So I'm sure we've all been part of a meeting where we feel really distracted because of all the background noise that's going on. We've also been in stressful situa situations with our fingers on the mute button. Fortunately, Teams includes a noise suppression feature that filters out background noises in real time using artificial intelligence. Common background noises we all dread, such as lawnmowers, loud keystrokes, and dogs barking will no longer be an issue to your meetings. So you can all let out a sigh of relief. The next thing I want to cover is the meeting attendance report. If you're looking to see who came to your meeting and how long they joined, Teams has a new feature, which allows you to download an extensive report about the attendees during the meeting. If you want to send a quick email to everyone in your team, you can send emails directly to a channel. This feature brings efficiency and definitely enhances the collaboration experience. Along with full collaboration, you may want to share private or confidential information to just a subset of folks. Private channels are great because they're only visible to specified members of a team and allow you to discuss sensitive information such as budgets, resourcing, and strategic decisions without having to make a brand new team. Now, many of us may need to make important announcements from to our fellow team members from time to time, Teams includes a built-in announcement feed template that allows you to fully customize the announcement, such as modifying the headline, uh, you can add background images, you can change color schemes, and a lot more, so you can send out eye-catching announcements easily. Sometimes we may need to be in multiple places at once, and Teams allows us to do just that. You can join multiple meetings and quickly switch between them without having to hang up on any of them. I'm sure many of you can agree with me that constantly switching between chats can also be inefficient and somewhat annoying. While with Teams, you can open multiple chat windows on one screen. In addition, you can keep an eye on a chat uh, with your call in one window and browse for files in another. As you can see, Teams is great uh, for productivity. Um, this is an image of a pop-out chat window. 
There are many ways to pop out chats in Teams. Um, one simple way is by double clicking any conversation in the chat tab um, for that chat. And uh, another way is by using the search bar at the top. Um, like Vlad was saying earlier, you can type a slash pop command um, followed by the name of the person. This video uh, will demonstrate how you can quickly make an, an announcement in Teams. So uh, first you can navigate to the bottom of the conversation box and click on the format icon. This will open up a detailed window of uh, many additional formatting options. Uh, next, you can click on the announcement dropdown. Now you can type in a headline as well as a subheadline. You can also use the many formatting options to spruce up your text. So over here, I'm just gonna write something really quickly and then just use the bold option. Um, now you can customize the background color as well. Or you can even uh, add a background image that you like. You can also post your announcement across multiple channels in Teams. As you can see, we're just posting into the uh, important and visual channel as well. Thank you for your attention. Now I'll be passing it back over to Vlad um, so he can go over the possible use cases for teams within the university. So he's gonna pass it back to me, but he's gonna keep the slides because if mine were washed out and theirs weren't, let's keep with something that worked. So yep, uh, I'll, hopefully that'll work. Yeah. So if you go to the next slide, please. Sure. Okay. So. We've covered a lot of how Teams works and what the various components are, although I will tell you that we haven't covered anywhere near all of them in the interest of time. And I encourage you to go keep browsing and finding new options within it. Um, I wanna talk about some of the possible use cases. I'm sure you guys have your own ideas what you can use Teams for uh, based on, on this presentation and your previous experience with it. But here's some ideas we had based on our experience with uh, primarily our experience with migrating away from Sakai. As you all know, Sakai was used heavily, not just for, uh, not for just internal LMS role, but also to manage all sorts of group sites. Um, as we are working our way through um, moving away from Sakai, we have analyzed all the various types of non-education uh, focused sites in Sakai and to see what people were using them for. And these are some of the examples we came across. Um, Obviously, remote work. This is a big one for all of us today. We all know that we have to work remotely and stay in touch with our colleagues. So, as you know, as IT professionals, we are we know we can use forty-seven thousand tools. You know, from Slack, from to Discord, to WebEx, to WhatsApp, to Skype, to Zoom, and some of us have all of those open on our desktop at all times. But none of those tools really are as integrated or or as far-reaching as Teams is when it comes to collaborative work. The majority of them are focused on meeting technology. And those are great at it. I'm not suggesting that Teams is better or worse than any of them, but Teams offers the entirety of your work environment in one place, um, which is not something necessarily that the other ones do. And by the way, this is also what we are uh, we want to support both uh, WebEx and Zoom as meeting alternatives within Teams. So you can use those if that's if that you prefer and use Teams for the rest of the capabilities it offers. But beyond the needs of IT teams, which can generally manage themselves, we have needs of administrative folks, we have the needs of faculty, um, and we are not always a stack savvy, and maybe sometimes they are, but not always. So this can offer them a tool that you can support for your entire organization and have a unified way of presenting that information across multiple teams to, to your entire organization. They're also really easy to, to, to deploy and support because you only have to worry about one environment and it's something that's already bound to their Office 65 accounts and is really easy and obvious to deploy. They don't have to do anything special. The Teams app nowadays installs with the Office um, tool set and it works on all the platforms regardless of what they are familiar with using. So beyond the, the remote work arcs aspect you can also think of teams being used for project sites and i'm going to actually have a bit of an example of how you can use teams for project management itself the live collaboration via um, 
teleconferencing and meetings we already covered. I think uh, Liz did a great job on that. You can also use it for student projects, and I have maybe one idea or more I'm going to show in the next couple of slides. Another example we have people used uh, Teams or Teams like functionality for has been uh, a recruitment and onboarding. For example, um, you may want to have a team that is used to uh, select a new employee. Maybe you, you, are, you are going through a hiring process and while the HR tools handle part of that process, how you internally review your employees, keep track of their um, applications and the information you've collected about them, having a evaluation committee review them and provide contents, maybe have your uh, interviews with them via Teams and then save the recording within the team. So if one of the um, members of the committee did not was not able to attend, they can review that interview process. Have all those comments, all that information stored in one location. At the same time, once a new hire comes on board, maybe you want to have a period of training and adjustment, right? We all know that anytime that somebody new comes to the organization, they need a lot of training about the organization itself and about the procedures in place. You could very well set up a team that holds all your educational environment for all new hires. So you could have all the onboarding documentation, all your procedures in one location. Uh, you can have um, any, any sort of um, forms they need to fill in, check boxes they need to check to make sure everything has been covered as part of their onboarding. You can even have senior team members participate in those teams. So if the new hire has questions about their new work environment, they could ask the questions there and somebody could answer them no matter where they are. Basically, as a welcoming committee sort of um, environment. Obviously, you could use it to hold your resources, right? We often warn folks to not use their personal OneDrive or personal box or personal Google Drive to store critical work documents because if they leave the department or leave the institution, now all that information might be lost as part of the deprovisioning process for individuals. So we definitely recommend you use the shared storage available with Teams to master data important to your, to your organization. Obviously, you can also use shared box drives or you know, SharePoint sites or whatever else makes sense for you, but that is one of the options you have in the toolbox to support um, your shared documentation management. Obviously, you can use it for just organize your schedules. It does come with a shared schedule calendar. You can add a, a shared calendar to everybody's um, uh, normal calendar views. You could post, you know, group events in, in that calendar. In fact, some of you may actually be familiar with this as RUIT is, does exactly that. There is the shared RUIT calendar and that's part of the team as well. One of the options we haven't talked about at all because it's sort of a, an advanced topic to leave it to yourself to explore is the shifts capability. Microsoft Teams has a built-in shifts management system. So if you work with a group of folks that are more shift driven or um, work on a particular hours, you can actually organize it that way. You can allow users to trade shifts. You can schedule shifts. You can sign up for shifts. Uh, you can assign tasks to a shift. So let's say if you needed to have something done on a particular shift, you can assign it to that particular time slot, regardless of who's holding the time slot. And this, by the way, might be a really useful feature to explore as we return to work. And we are worried about how much how the space is being used and who is in the office at any given time. You might want to limit um, by using the shifts feature who is available and who can work on particular days and keep track of it that way. Something to keep in mind. The other thing that we have seen teams use for quite a bit lately has been uh, telemedicine. Um, there's at least two or three examples that come to mind that I'm aware of, but there are probably more out there. We know a number of groups which are conducting um, uh, doctor patient sessions via Teams and being able to record them and have them be reviewed by other uh, medical staff afterwards with the correct permission set. And in one case, we have assisted one of our organizations within Rutgers to set up a fairly complex system um, that allows um, teams to be used on mobile devices in halfway homes that to securely be able to, to provide services to folks which wouldn't be able, otherwise able to get anywhere. And that was an effort between our team and uh, the Rutger, one of the Rutgers Medical Schools and the New Jersey, I believe, Correctional Facilities Group. And in two days, we set up this fairly complex system that allows um, telemedicine to happen in a you know, very challenging environment. So I'm sure you guys can come up with more examples. I have two that I wanted to show you specifically um, when it comes to the um, to using Planner 
as a project management tool. We haven't really talked about Planner a lot, but the Planner feature of 365 only works within groups slash teams, whatever you want to call them right now. Um, you, well, you can certainly use it as a personal tool. If you create a ad hoc team just for yourself, create a self-created team and just use Planner within it, it really comes into its own once you use it as a um, collaborative tool within Teams. So uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. I'm actually losing track of my slides. I apologize. There we go. So when you create a project site, uh, let's say you want to do some project management, you want to create a project site. I think you need to think of which components make most sense to use. Obviously, you want to create the, select, the correct team's template. Um, let's cover the four different templates available out of the box. And as you mentioned, once you've picked them, you are stuck with them. So you may want to experiment with the four templates first and see which ones make most sense to you for various projects in teams you can destroy if you don't like the outcome before you actually know which ones make sense for your areas. Um, so for a project site, obviously you would want to make sure the documents are shared um, you know, with, it, with the entire project. And one of the good things about using this methodology is that as you all know, projects grow and web, right? So you may have an important work project that starts with two people, the, they expand to five people, they shrink to three, two new, two new team members come into that project, all, those, all that team dynamic happens. Well, if you shared all your documents via email, or if you put them in your personal drive and whatnot, and all the conversations were had via individual email messages, all that information is lost to any new team members. Having all that information in Teams means that when you add a new participant to your project, they automatically have access to all that wealth of information of what's gone on before. That brings them up to speed quicker. It makes it easier for them to understand and find all the documents. They don't have to ask around, like, where's the project plan or all those other things. They can reside in one area that's accessible to everybody. It's also very securely stored, right? So if somebody needs to leave the team or somebody has left the institution, you can remove them from the team and now they no longer have access to all that information that you have there. So I want to talk a bit about Planner because I think it's one of the coolest features in the software. Um, and I have a little video that I'm going to ask Zane. Uh, before Zane press play, I want to talk a bit about Planner. So Planner is probably most simply, no, no, you can, you can uh, most simply defined as a Kanban board for those of you who are familiar with Kanban boards. However, it does a lot more than that. So, um, Let's start the video, please. So you can create a new plan. Um, you can select the planner app and either create a new plan from scratch or select an existing plan and attach it to your team. And within that, you have multiple buckets of items. You can rename your buckets, you can move them around as you see fit, or you can create new buckets. This is fairly basic Kanban board logic, right? Nothing really particular, it's strange. You can take items and move them between various buckets. So any task you might have created can be moved around and moved back. Or you can create new tasks in any bucket you want to create them. That is enough to create. You can just put a name in it and add it. Or you can edit them, and this is washed out, I apologize, and add a lot of options. You can add people who are assigned to the task. You can set the or change the bucket they reside in, the progress, the priority, uh, start dates and due dates. You can also um, add um, color tags to them. By the way, these are fully customizable, so you can choose what, what those tags mean. You can rename them any way you want to for each individual plan. You can add notes about it. And when you add the notes or later on the checkboxes, you can decide if they are displayed on the Kanban board card or not. That's entirely up to you. The checklist items can be added as well. Uh, what needs to be done to accomplish that task. They can uh, individually be marked as completed or not completed as time goes on. You can add any attachments you want to a task, files, links, SharePoint sites. And you can also make comments that are logged and associated with that particular task. So any number of people who are part of the team can add comments to the task and update the status. And you can see the log of all the comments made uh, associated with a task. So 
And you can also look at all the bits of information displayed on the card about the status of the task, number of, of, of uh, items that are still remaining to be completed with it, and so on. You can also reorganize the view by assigned to, by the progress of the tasks, by the due dates of the tasks, and by labels and by priorities. So any of the fields you get configured about the task can be used to resort your entire view of, of the entire plan. If that's not enough different views, you can also add filters. So you can filter which items you see based on all of these options or switch to the chart view. The chart view will show you the completeness based on status, based on bucket, based on priority, um, or based uh, on each individual user and how they are progressing with their tasks. Finally, you have a schedule view. The schedule view can be monthly or weekly. Think of this as being your Gantt chart, where all the items are mapped, um, and it can be edited straight from the schedule view. You can change all the items, and you can create new ones from here as well if you add, an, add them to your project. Although probably the board view is the most common one for most folks. So that was a really fast look at Planner. I personally love Planner. Uh, my team will tell you that we use it as our uh, primary way of organizing all of our 365 tasks, and there are a lot of them that we keep track of any one time. So take a look at it, see if it meets your needs. We really don't think that Planner is an answer to everything. I think there is a spectrum of project management tools um, that goes from Planner to Smartsheets to uh, Project Online, but think of which ones make sense for you and see if that fits into your project management tool set. Uh, some of the other ones have a much higher learning curve than, than, than Planner does. So maybe for smaller projects or people who have a lot of project management experience, this might come in really handy. Next slide, please. So how could you use the Teams for, for student projects? First of all, you can leverage the self-created component of Teams. Students, if, if they are aware that Teams exists, can go create their own teams and they can self-organize without having to interact uh, with anybody you know, in the IT organization unless they need support. They can be used for a wide variety of things, right? You can use it for research projects. So you know, organize the research by the documentation, make a plan for all the tasks that need to be happening, all those various components. Um, you might use it for capstone projects where you have five or six students that need to work over a long period of time for their graduation product. You may use them as impromptu group school assignment projects, right? So we all know that we have, you know, various group assignments that are in, in a lot of our classes, and this can be used as a way to organize that, you know, the, the, the content, do shared editing, uh, be able to work on, on, on documents together. The next part, of course, which is probably critical to all of us nowadays, but I think it's even more critical to students, is you can connect from anywhere, including any mobile devices. I'm not sure if any of you have gotten the chance to play with all the office tools on the mobile devices, but you have access to Word and PowerPoint and Excel and all those tools on all the mobile devices products right now. And they all integrate with Teams as well on the mobile devices. So as our pocket devices have become full power computing machines nowadays, um, Teams works on your mobile device as well, which for a lot of students may be very important. Not everybody's carries around a large laptop anymore, maybe they only use an iPad, and all of this works for them everywhere. Obviously, it can be used for impromptu meetings. Uh, it can be used to sketch out ideas on the whiteboards. We haven't even talked about the whiteboards. Uh, meetings and teams have whiteboards available. Maybe you want to use your whiteboards to sketch out ideas. Maybe you want to use your whiteboards to um, discuss a document you're working on. Let's say you have a piece of graphical um, work, you have a graph, you have a presentation, and you want to be able to just circle with your finger on the screen, the whiteboard is part of it and can be used for that. So I think the sky is the limit in how many of those things you want to use. I, I know we're going long, and I want to just make sure we have some time for additional questions. There are, a, uh, when we make the presentation available, we'll be on the web page. Th these are all live links to a lot of documentation that you might want to reference that we talked about. And before I pass control back to um, Frank, do we have any additional questions that we haven't answered yet? Let me go real quick through, um, through the backlog. And uh, Liz and Zane, please feel free to answer the, the questions that are sitting in the backlog. Yeah, I've been Hi. answering some of the ones in the chat. There was one about HIPAA compliance that I assigned to you, Vlad. Thank you. So um, Office 65 in general is a 
HIPAA compliant platform. One of the reasons why we are, I want to say even slow, slow with integrations is because every other third party product we integrate with um, teams needs to be vetted to make sure that it doesn't pose a risk. And we, we are doing that to ensure that HIPAA compliance is maintained. The stream and meetings components are part of their highest trust ring when it comes to uh, how they look at uh, a security. And they are both high trust rated, which is the third party certification for um, that covers medical data. And in fact, they even have a Teams and Stream template specific for medical institutions, which we don't currently have access to directly. So uh, you should be good on that one. The Teams app right now, and that, that's a question that just came through, whether we, uh, we expect them to install the company portal app. And the answer is you don't have to. The Teams app, we are not forcing the, um, the portal compliance enrollment because it can be used with any number of other team um, hosts. So no, if you don't want to, you don't have to. In fact, the Office apps and the Teams app are not forced uh, into the Intune uh, ring. Now, obviously, uh, anybody that's discovered by HIPAA should do that. But for students, we're not forcing that. Uh, I should have noted as well that with Teams, you can participate in multiple institutions. I am actually, you know, and you can switch between multiple hosting institutions, some of which you are an owner or a member, like we are in our Ruckus environment. But you can also, for example, switch over to using Teams with a colleague university as a guest or a different organization as well. Uh, sorry to interrupt. There have been some questions that were in the chat that weren't addressed from the Q and A. Um, someone asked, will Teams meetings allow breakout rooms? I don't know if you want to talk about that, Vlad. Yes. Right. So the some folks have actually already used the multi-meeting uh, part that um, Liz spoke about earlier as a breakout room because you can always just jump into a different channel and start an instant met message in that channel, but that requires people to collaborate, right? So, you know, and students don't always do that. The um, Teams is, has announced this summer they're going to introduce formal breakout rooms. I expect that to show up sometime in July or August, but I can't speak for sure about that's, that's going to happen or not. There was also a question, I'll answer this one. If you want to do polling during a meeting with Microsoft Forms, can you do that on the fly or do you have to set it up ahead of time? Uh, this is an issue where we've been looking into or trying to gauge some of the in other integrations available because right now when you're in a meeting, you can't actually do real time. There is a way around it, but there's no official polling, uh, I guess, product available right within the meeting. What you have to do is you do have to set up Microsoft Forms as an integration for your team ahead of time or for the meeting. Um, and then while you're in the meeting, uh, in the chat section of the meeting, you'll have to pull up Microsoft Forms as the integration and set it up that way. And then people can answer in the chat. It's, it's not the most convenient thing, but it, it is available. It is a way to poll during a meeting. Um, but if there are any issues with that or if you know, anybody has any uh, products you want us to look into in terms of integration, we can do that as well. We know there are a couple of polling tools like Poly and so on that we are going to look at, but if there are specific ones you have in mind, let us know and we'll try to look at them as well. The other thing okay. is, you know, it's a quick poll. You can always use the, the, the raise hands option to, to collect yeah. some input. Yeah. Um, Deanna asks, do you anticipate requiring students to download the company portal that Rutgers has required on their phones. No, so that's that's the one I asked so just a bit earlier. We don't Sorry, for teams now. That's okay. I have staff members that have had an issue with downloading to their phone. Will OIT be able to help them through these issues? Absolutely. Uh, somebody said, when I add an app, it gets removed, and it says your admin has updated your settings. Some of your pin apps may have been moved. Uh, that um, was an issue we ran into not too long ago, right, Vlad? Uh, Zane can answer that one. Okay. Yeah, so uh, that was actually an issue that we had uh, a couple of weeks ago, and um, we were able to contact, uh, have contact with Microsoft and uh, resolve that issue. Um, that shouldn't be uh, happening anymore, but uh, if it is, just uh, send an email to us and we'll uh, handle it from there. Where will the recording for this session be posted? You said the there's a specific website, Vlad? 
Yeah, I'm going to let Frank answer that one at the end okay. because I think there's a whole web page being set up for the entire lecture series. So we'll provide all the content on that web page. Great. Um, and the rest of the questions, I'm, I will try my best to answer in the Q&A as well, um, as well as the rest of us. Okay, so unless there are other questions that you guys need the answer to, I think I'm going to pass this back to Frank uh, for the closing information as well as the um, uh, future meeting information. Zane, can you go to the next slide, please? Sure. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Vlad, Liz, and Zane. Uh, that was certainly informative, very enlightening. Thank you for all the good work. That that was really, really terrific to get us started here with the IT lecture series. So as we wrap up today, I'd like to thank all of our presenters and everyone who has worked so hard to make this first installment of our lecture series possible. Um, I'd also like to point out that the next installment of our lecture series will be held in August on a date which has yet to be determined. Uh, so stay tuned for further announcements. And if you'd really like to help us out in making this series successful going forward, then we ask you to take a few moments and provide us with feedback. The slide that's displayed on the screen at this time has a URL for a brief survey that will provide us with some valuable information on how we can improve the series. And I ask that you please help us by taking the survey. We really want to commit to making this uh, lecture series into something that is valuable for the community. And the best way to do that is to listen to your feedback. So uh, please take a moment, take the survey. So many thanks to everyone who presented today. Many thanks to all who virtually attended today. Uh, I'll throw a number out. I saw as many as 245 people that were on at any one given time, but I know that the number was higher than that. Um, so we hope you enjoy it. We hope you found it informative and we look forward to hosting again. We will be sending out additional information on the August date when that's finalized. And we'll also follow up with information uh, on the website regarding the recording of today's event, as Vlad just mentioned. So from me, thank you, be well, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you all again in August. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.